Luke 19, verse 29 to 34. Verse 29 reads, And it came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethage and Bethany, at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in the which at your entering ye shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never man sat. Loose him and bring him hither. If any, if, and, sorry, and if any man ask you, Why do ye loose him? Thus shall he say unto him, Because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way, and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for being able to uh, just uh, come aside again this afternoon to uh, open your word for a little while, delve into its riches once again. Lord, I do uh, pray, Father, for uh, your leading and your guiding in the word of God. Pray for the work with the Holy Spirit in our hearts individually, Lord. You know what we need. And Lord, you have something special for each of our lives in service for you. And I do pray that you would just help us and guide us to, uh, Lord, see that from your word this afternoon and, Lord, desire that and, uh, and pray that you would uh, Lord, work mightily as of said, Lord. And I ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, this morning we looked at uh, this, this account from when the Lord sent the two disciples to, to fetch the colt that he would then ride into Jerusalem uh, for that day, Palm Sunday, which will be next, next weekend, um, for those that, that, uh, that celebrate that. But uh, then at that particular, sorry, at this particular time, the Lord was sending the two disciples to, to get to, to fetch that colt so he could ride it down to Jerusalem. And uh, be as uh, we saw this morning in Zechariah 9.9, uh, 9, and we'll go back there later, uh, to you know, fulfill prophecy that he'd come in the meek and mild Jesus on the, uh, on the cold. This afternoon I want to, I want to have a look at this, at this from the point of view of the two disciples rather than from uh, the point of view of the owners of the cold as we looked at this morning. And uh, just go there and have a look in verse... Um, number 32 well, let me just read and it says and they that were sent went their way now you stop and you think about that here is the Lord the son of God instructing the two disciples to go and fetch this cult and the Lord tells them the Lord says to them uh, if they ask, if the owners ask, why are you, why are you taking the colt? Just say the Lord hath need of him. And so that tells, that tells those two guys that when the Lord was sending them, uh, the owner didn't know. Now, I realise we're talking about a different culture and, and everything else back then, and, and we also knew that, we've also seen this morning how Everyone at that time knew, knew who Jesus was. You know, he'd been raising the dead. Lazarus hadn't been uh, long raised from the dead at this time. Uh, and, uh, and so people were, wherever the Lord went, if the Lord went to Bethany where Lazarus was, the people were going to see Lazarus as well as the Lord. Such was the attraction. So the Lord was known, uh, very well known. And so like I said, it was a different culture at that time. But nonetheless, you stop and picture uh, being sent to take someone's cult, uh, the cult of an ass, and, and those people don't know that you're coming. Put just, I, I don't know about you, but I, I put myself in that situation and go, Ooh, I'm going to take someone's, someone's cult and they don't know I'm coming to do this. But yet they knew that God had sent them, and, and that's the words that it says there uh, in verse number 32, and they that were sent. 
And you know, I, I guess in an overall sense this afternoon, I, I want to look at, at, that, at, at that thought. When God sends you to do something in your life, whether it be to, to do some, some ministry, whether it be to uh, you know, a change of life, a change of whatever, when God's in it, when God says, I want you to do this, and, and it just doesn't seem normal or logical, uh, you know, we've got, to, we've got to just learn to just obey what God says. And I'll be frankly honest with you, you know, like uh, last weekend, when uh, we had some of our old friends from, from way back uh, here for our renewal of our slash Aussie wedding, uh, it was interesting listening to one of them, a fellow that, that was here that I've known since I was, a, I was a kid, we went to school together. And he was saying on Friday night that, <clears throat> that when the Lord first called me to go to the Philippines, uh, that was so far out of left field for them, for him. And he, and I, and I, I'd kind of forgotten this, but I remember him saying a few things at the time. He was kind of questioning it. He said, "You're sure about that? You're really, you're really sure?" I mean, it was just so totally out of left field. It, it would never, it was never even a, a topic of conversation whatsoever. I'd never indicated anything uh, to him. Uh, about or you know or to or to other friends or other others you know other um, other believers I never said anything to them and then when the Lord called me to go to the Philippines they're kind of going what they they couldn't fathom it it was just beyond beyond their comprehension and let me just say you know sometimes the Lord will set will, will lay on your heart to do something that just doesn't seem logical. Um, I'll just I'll just put this little disclaimer in here. Make sure it really is God. Make sure you're not just making your own mind up on something because it sounds good and it appeals to the flesh. And that's easy to be deceived in that area. So make sure it's really God. But if you really know, without a doubt, that what uh, is laid on your heart is from the Lord. Uh, don't worry about what others think. These two guys, they went on down the road, they're thinking, we're about to go and take somebody's colt, and they, by the sound of it, they don't even know we're coming. But God said to do this, and He'll work it out. How many times have you been faced with something in your life as a Christian where you think, this is just not going to work? Where the Lord's laid something on your heart where he's, he's led you in a certain path and you think, no, this is crazy. And yet, you, you, by being obedient to what the Lord has shown you to do, he has worked it out. And he just opens the door just at the right time for you to step through and to continue on down that path. And that's the way the Lord does it. He doesn't say, oh, look, look, look down here, I've opened up every door for you to see right on through. No, he doesn't do that. He only opens up one door at a time. A little step at a time. That's the way God works. If the Lord had opened up all the doors of my life so I could see right down from the start of ministry right on through now, right on through to the future, I'd probably go, nah. No. I'd be a real Aussie, yeah, no. God works, uh, as we say, in mysterious ways. His ways are beyond finding out. And so these disciples, they, they headed off to, to do what the Lord told them to do. Now, I want to think of a few points here this afternoon about that. First point this afternoon is, the Lord gave them the right words to say at the right time. Have a, have a look there in Luke 19, Luke 19 verse 33. And... Uh, in Luke 19, verse 33, it says, And as they were loosing the, loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? Why are you doing that? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. The Lord had told them, uh, back up earlier, in verse 31, 
he, the Lord had told these two disciples what to say at the right time. Now, I've always looked at some verses. Go to go to uh, Matthew chapter ten. Go to Matthew chapter ten. Keep your place open at Luke Luke nineteen. That's all. But go to Matthew chapter ten. And here we are going to see the importance. You know, you've heard many times through your, your, your life as a Christian, well, you know, you should be, you know, I even said it this morning, you know, you should be you know, get, getting into the Word of God, you should, should have regular time in the Word of God, you need to digest the Word of God, get it in, into your heart. Well, here's a, here's, a, here's a very real reason why. It's not just so you can say, well, I'm faithful in reading my Bible every day. Well, that's good if you do that. Praise the Lord for that. But it goes far, far beyond that. It's not just so you can be, you know, tick the boxes as a Christian. It goes far beyond that. Have a look here in Luke, uh, sorry, Matthew chapter 10. And uh, we'll just look at a few verses. Matthew 10. Start in verse number 16. Now, let's set the scene here. The Lord Jesus Christ is talking to his disciples and... Uh, and, he's, and he's, he's giving them instruction on what's going to happen. He said, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, uh, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you uh, in their synagogues. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. Verse 19, But when they deliver you up. Take no thought how or what you shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak. For it is not you that not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. Now I, I, I used to always look at that and and this is you know my my uh, my bad as as the expression goes. I would not I, I've never I, I'd Many years, I just kind of looked at it. I was thinking, future tense. It is future tense from when, from when, uh, from when the Lord was talking. But I was thinking future tense beyond our time, which it's not. The Lord was talking about the disciples once He had gone to the cross, been buried, risen from the dead, ascended back to heaven. The disciples started there, the, the ministry that the Lord had for them. And you stop and you think about what is what's written there. Uh, you shall be brought before the governors and kings for my sake. Uh, verse 17, you'll be delivered up to councils. They will scourge you in their synagogues. Jewish context, that part. And, uh, and so let, let's see something. So keep your place open to Matthew 10. Then go over to uh, Acts chapter 4. Go over to Acts chapter 4. So here, here we are. Um, the Lord Jesus has been to the cross been buried, risen from the dead, ascended back to heaven, and uh, the day of Pentecost comes, the Holy Spirit of God has given as promised, uh, and they start the ministry that the Lord had called them to, and so they started to do greater, greater works than what the Lord did. And let me just put this aside here at this point. Um, yeah, we're putting the sign gifts aside. We know the sign gifts were for the Jews, not for the Gentiles. Okay? So the, the tongues and the, and the so forth and so on, and the healings and we know that was for the for the Jews, not for us. Now, here in Acts chapter four, Peter and John had healed the lame man. Uh, Acts chapter three, healed the lame man when they were going to the temple at the hour of prayer, and that causes a you know, great a great awakening there. There's thousands of people saved, and, uh, and we can see that in Acts four verse four, about five thousand men were saved. So you can add women and children to that. So probably 10,000 people. Praise the Lord. Great, a great, a great happen. Now, uh, the, uh, the chief priests, the high priest, uh, if you have a look in verse 5, it says, and it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many were, as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together in Jerusalem. And so, here we are, this is what the Lord's talking about here in Matthew chapter 10. You shall be delivered up to councils. Uh, and you shall be, uh, they shall scourge you in their synagogues. 
Here it is. The Lord had told them back there in Matthew 10 what they were going to experience in the ministry when, when, yeah, when they really got into it after he had ascended. But now have a look. Acts chapter 4 verse 8. It says, Then Peter filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel. And so he then goes on and starts to preach on the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 10. You know, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, and he preaches to them. Uh, he's the, the stone which is set at Lord of you builders. Verse 11. Verse 12. One of my favourite verses. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. What's God doing? Matthew chapter 10. He's, he's doing exactly as he said he would. He said, But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak. Note, Acts 4 8, Peter's filled with the Holy Ghost when he starts to preach. And that's exactly what the Lord said there in Matthew 10. Um, for it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. The Holy Spirit. And so what are we, what are we seeing here? We are seeing the, the, how vital it is for you and I to be a student of the Word of God. You know, all the memory verses that, that, that's been done for the last year and, and, and is being done again this year, there is a purpose in that. It's not just so you can say, well, I know these verses. Like John 14, verse 1 to 6, that never you know, quoted before. What a blessing. They are great verses of encouragement. And you just never know when God's going to need to call on that knowledge of the Word of God in those verses to say it to somebody that, that needs to hear those verses. Uh, if it's someone unsaved, John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I am the way, the truth, the life. There is no other way. So, you know, the Word of God, to be reading the Word of God, to be memorising the Word of God, it is so very vital for your life as a Christian. I'm sure when God gives you the opportunity to share the Word of God with someone, you want to be able to, 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 to explain to them properly about your Lord and Saviour. At times, when the Lord, when you when you've got an opportunity to talk to someone about something, you know the Lord then brings back to back to memory or back to into your mind a verse that you haven't read or quoted or thought of perhaps for years. That's the Holy Spirit of God. That's what He said He would do. So here's Peter and John back in Acts chapter four. And Peter's preached this wonderful message about the Lord Jesus Christ to the, uh, to the uh, high priest and everyone else that was there. And verse 13, they said, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, in other words, the confidence, and they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they'd been with Jesus. They perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. That's, in other words, it wasn't their abilities that was coming out that, that, that produced that confidence that was in them that could be seen. It was the work of the Holy Spirit of God. Brethren, just as the Lord gave, literally gave those two disciples the words to say to the owners of the cult, just as we can see that the Lord uh, will give to any born-again believer the words to speak through the Holy Spirit of God, we can see that the, the importance of the Word of God, that we, you know, that we memorize it, that we get it into our hearts. Let's think of another scenario. Go over to Luke chapter 20. Luke 20, so just back near where we started. Except Luke 20. And this is, this is the same, this is another result of, of really getting into the Word of God. And the Lord giving you the words that 
that, that you should say or should not say for that matter at different times. Let me, let me just say something here for a minute. In this day and age where there is so much happening, whether it be you know, with, the, with, the, with the virus, whether it be you know, world events and everything else, and we look and we can see uh, that it's all channeling in, going in towards the, the, the blessed hope and then the tribulation. We can see it. One of the things that I notice that has become so prevalent amongst born again believers is their own opinions. Oh, well, I reckon it's. Oh, but, but. And there's great conflict between believers. And I look at this chapter, and, and yes, it's not. This is not talking about between uh, born again believers, but nonetheless, there's a there's a principle here that we need to learn. Uh, have a look in uh, in Luke 20, verses 20 to 26. We won't read them all uh, for time's sake. Luke 20, verse 20 to 26. And, and as always, you know, the, the Pharisees, the chief priests, uh, etc., were always watching the Lord. They were always trying to catch him out. Verse 20, it says, And they watched him and sent forth spies which should feign themselves just men, that they might take hold, take note of this, that they might take hold of his words, so that they might deliver him unto the power and authority of the governor. And so in verse uh, number 21, they butter, it, they butter up the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can just see the Lord, he's just standing there going, really, how pathetic. You know, giving him this, you know, this great wrap up. You know, Master, we know that thou sayest and teachest rightly, never ex neither acceptest thou the person of any, but, that, but, but teachest the way of God truly. What a snow job. Verse 22, is it lawful for us to give tribute unto Caesar or no? Did the Lord give his opinion? Mm -mm. Nope. He said, uh, verse 23, it says, But the Lord perceived their craftiness and said unto them, Why tempt you me? In other words, really? Verse 24, Show me a penny. Whose image and superscription hath it? They answered and said, Caesar's. And he said unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which be Caesar's, and unto God the things which be God's. And they could not take hold of his words before the people. And they marveled at his answer and held their peace. See, that's the wisdom of God. You and I have knowledge. We read the word of God. We, we look at what's happening in the world. And we, get not, we have knowledge. We can see, oh, this is this prophecy coming to pass. And, and we can see this is heading in that direction in relation to you know, what we can see in the Word of God. And, but this is where the trap comes in. The devil then goes, what's your opinion on that? What do you reckon? What, does this sound right to you? And we form our own opinions so very quickly. And you know what you end up with? <laughs> Amongst the brethren. What do you do? Throw your opinion out and just get in the book. Mm -hmm. Have a look further on in the chapter. Uh, verses 27 to 40. They try again. Verse 27 to 40. And, and again, obviously, I'm not going to read all of the verses. It says, Then came to him certain of the Sadducees, which deny that there is any resurrection. And they start on about um, if if somebody, somebody's, somebody's, somebody dies, if a guy dies, having a wife with no kids, then you know they go through the process. You know, in the law, you know his brother then is to marry that, that lady and, and raise up children unto her brother, the brother, uh, sorry, unto their brother. And it goes right on down to this, that they say right on down to the seventh brother, and he dies and they haven't had any children. Whose are they in, in heaven, basically? And uh, what did the Lord say? Um, verse thirty-three. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of them is she? Is their, is their question. Uh, for seven had her to wife. Verse 34, And Jesus answering said unto them, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage, but they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world, talking of heaven, 
and the resurrection from the dead. Neither marry nor are given in marriage. Neither can they die anymore, for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. And so he answers them perfectly from his, you know, scripturally. And, uh, and then verse 39, it, there, it says, Then certain of the scribes and, and so answering said, Master, thou hast well said. And after that they durst not ask him any question at all. Brethren, we can have all knowledge, but if we don't have wisdom, we lack. If we have all knowledge, but don't have the wisdom on how to apply that knowledge, we're going to go down the rabbit trail of our own opinions, of what, if, what seems to be right to us. And that's dangerous in this day, in this day and age as born-again believers. We need to stop using our own noodle up here but lean on the Lord's working through the Holy Spirit of God. Scrap the opinions. How many times do we go, oh, I reckon, yeah, I reckon what this one says is right, and then goes on down past that time and it didn't happen, it didn't work out very well. Just, just stick with God. Like I said this morning, what should we be looking at in this day and age? We should be looking at those that are lost. Because what if the Lord comes tomorrow and we haven't witnessed to those people we've had a burden for? Because we got off on a rabbit trail with all the stuff that's happening. Keep the focus on the right thing. Second, uh, if, the, uh, <clears throat> if the owner, and I realise we're looking at the disciples, but nonetheless, if the owner had known the Lord was about to have the cult collected, he probably would, probably would have cleaned him up and groomed him ready to be taken. Talk about the cult. If the Lord, sorry, go back to Zechariah chapter 9. Have a look back there. Zechariah 9, in verse 9. Let's get on anyway. Zechariah 9, 9. We looked at it this morning. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh. Unto thee he is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, upon a colt, the foal of an ass. And so, um, you know, here's, here's the two disciples that come on down. If, if, the, if the owners had known uh, the Lord was coming, they're going, well, that doesn't look like somebody hasn't ridden him. You know, it had to be in the right condition. It had to be that. It looked like he hadn't, he hadn't ridden on it for the Lord to be of lowly demeanour as he rode into Jerusalem as shown in that verse there that we see. Now, the reason why I've still included that one in this this afternoon is this. How we appear to people being used by the Lord, it must first be a work of God. The ass had to be as it was. Obviously not, not ridden before. It was it hadn't been groomed or was there anything ready for the Lord. You, know, you just don't think about it. If you knew the Lord wanted you to, to to use something that you had, you're gonna prepare it so that it's, it's good good condition or ready to go. But this this ass, the, the guy didn't know that he was coming, the, 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 the disciples didn't know they didn't know the disciples were coming, sorry. And so it was just there as it was. And it had to be that way. It had to be so that it matched the Lord coming, as it says there in Zechariah 9.9, 9, uh, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, he is just, and having salvation, lowly, and riding an ass, uh, upon a colt of the foal of an ass. It had to match. And brethren, so must we. What does Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 say? Or verse 2. And be ye not, be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be not conformed to this world. Don't be like this world. You and I need to be different in the way that, that, that God wants us to be. Not like the world. We need to let God change us. It needs to be a work of God in us. Thirdly, when they were questioned, this, back to the two disciples, when they were questioned why they were taking the colt, 
and the disciples told the owner, the Lord hath need of him, Luke 30, 19 verse 34, there is no objection to this. He was satisfied with that. Now when we do, thinking about those two disciples, they did according to how the Lord told them to do. When something is done in accordance with what the Lord wants, done the way the Lord wants, then uh, it will work out the, the way that the Lord wants. The two disciples' act of obedience was blessed by the Lord. Thinking back to the beginning, I was saying about how what the Lord had them to do was different. Just going and taking some of this cult without the owner know, owners knowing that they were coming, but, and they did what they were told to do. It worked out the way it was supposed to. The Lord's ways are not our ways, but when we do things regardless of how it appears to be, when it's God's way, uh, it'll work out properly. When we try to add our, our own little flavour to it, think of King Saul in the Old Testament. King Saul went to do what God told him to do. And he did most of what God told him to do in those early days. But he added just a bit of his own flavour to it. And, you know, he blamed the people and, and so forth. But, but what did, what did uh, Samuel say? He said, you know, it's all... Um, Disobedience is it's worse than witchcraft. <clears throat> the Lord just wants obedience. So for you and I, brethren, we need to be we need to be you know, on the alert. We need to be sure that when we do things that the Lord has laid on us, that we do it just the way the Lord wants us to do it. Number four, the two disciples did not balk at going and taking someone's cult when instructed by the Lord to do so. They just obeyed in faith. And this is where it's all headed to. You stop and you think about it. The Lord, the Lord said to them, okay, I want you two guys to go down to, down to the city. Now you'll see a colt, you go down to the street, you'll see a colt tied there where a never man has sat. So obviously it looked like it, was, you know, it, it had never been sat on so they could recognise it. They go down, they're walking down the city, they're talking about it, they're going, yeah, I'm not sure I've really, I don't think I've seen anything down there, but anyway, the Lord said it's there, and so they're, they're going down just trusting what God had said to do. They get down there, they've already been told what to say to the owners when they, if they question them, uh, sorry, if they question them, and, and of course, as we know, that's what, exactly what happened. And the Lord did say, he said, uh, in verse number 31, he said, and if any man ask you, so they didn't know for sure that somebody was going to ask them, but the Lord's giving them instruction, you know, just in case, the Lord knew. So they're going down there by faith. They, don't, they, they haven't seen the cult. If anybody asks us, well, that's what we're going to say. That's just what the Lord said. Brethren, I don't, I don't know if you get this, but sometimes the Lord will just put something in your lap. You know the answer. You know what, what the scriptural answer is to say to people. But nonetheless, you're going, you're going off to do something the Lord's laid on you, and you just got to do it by faith, because you're just going, this just doesn't make sense. It's a time that God wants to use to build your faith. It may not be a big thing, but the Lord knows what is right for your life to help build your faith. It may be a big thing, because maybe the Lord wants to build your faith in a big way for, for what he has for you coming up. You've, you've, we've got to walk by faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. You know, uh, let me just say this. Faith is the absence of self-determination in our walk with the Lord. You stop and think about that. Faith is the absence of self-determination in our walk with the Lord. In this day and age, and I'm, just, I'm not trying to be mean when I say this because I'm the same. This thing up here so easily takes over from, from God's, God's work in our lives, from God's ways in our life. We so quickly and so easily say, well, this is what I'm going to do here, when God's wanting to do something in our lives. When he's wanting us to walk by faith, 
we so quickly self-determine what to do. So the Lord's put these two disciples into a situation where they're going down to the city and the Lord said, now there's a cold in this particular place. It's you know, pretty obvious that nobody's ever sat on it. It's probably a bit disheveled and, and like that. It's only a young cold, so it hasn't been brushed or groomed or anything like that. And when you see it, you'll know. Just have faith, it's all right. You'll, you'll recognise it. And if any man ask you, uh, just say the Lord hath need of it. Okay, all right, Lord. They walk by faith. And let me say, this is just before the Lord was crucified. Obviously for these two, it was, it was a task that didn't really mean, it didn't mean, it doesn't mean for us, we don't get for ourselves what it meant to them. The Lord assigned a task for those two guys that taught them something at that time. And so the, the application for you and I is this. When the Lord gives you something to do and it takes faith to do it, and to do it the way that he wants you to do it. Uh, he's giving it to you to help you to overcome, number one, uh, your own self-driven mind. He's, number two, he's giving you an opportunity to grow in trusting him when what he gives you to do just seems so impractical. I'm gonna go flog someone's donkey. Really? Well, that's, you know, what about the law? Um, you know, one I have to restore four for four donkeys for one of But Lord, you said go and take the donkey. And if any man asks you, in other words, if you can get away with it, it's all right. That's the way it sounds, doesn't it? God was teaching them how to walk by faith. The Lord always knew that the, the, that the owners would ask. But he put it like, well, yeah, if anyone asks, this is what you say. He was teaching them faith. It was, you know, we don't know for what purpose in their lives at that time, but he's teaching them an act of faith that would have worked in their lives for what was coming in their lives. And thus he does for you and I. So brother, stop and think about it. <clears throat> think about what we've looked at. The Lord gave them the words to say. He's given us his word to absorb into our lives, into our hearts, so that when the right time comes up, when we need those, those words, the Holy Spirit of God will remind us, whether it be to answer a man of the hope that lies within us, whether it be to encourage us, whether it be to, to give us the direction that we need to go in, in whatever it may be. When, when the Lord gives us a task that seems so impractical or just doesn't make sense, uh, you know, we know uh, that the Lord, the Lord, you know, the Lord will work it out. We'll have a heart that does not object. We just go and do, and that builds our faith. And that's what it's all about: walking by faith and not by sight. Just to close, just let's think about Moses again. We thought about him a little bit this morning. You know, Moses was self-determining about going down to Egypt. The burning bush not being consumed. God. Almighty, the I am, is speaking to him from the bush. And, and the Lord says, Moses, I'm going to send you down to Egypt to bring out the children of Israel. And he goes, who am I? Moses was self-determining. He was looking at himself. He hadn't learned uh, to just have faith and accept what the Lord had, had showed him to do. So brethren, Moses had 40 years, had proven 40 years earlier from, the, from before the burning bush. He had proven 40 years earlier that it was impossible for him himself to deliver the children of Israel, which is probably why he said, well, you know, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? I already tried and I failed. Exactly right. He had to learn to walk by faith and not by sight, and so must we. So must we. For the two disciples, it was an act of faith, by which time they were comfortable to do. And so let me ask you this in closing. Have we grown in faith as they did. Are you willing to pick up and do what the Lord lays at your feet to do? What the Lord lays on your heart to do? Even if it doesn't make sense. But just, just again, make sure it is God. Don't go off charging off doing something that's not really the Lord. 
If it's really God, do you trust Him? Do you have faith? That's what it's all about. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your grace, your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for being able to think about these things today. And, and Lord, uh, our whole life is to revolve around faith. We have to walk by faith, not by sight. And Lord, I just do pray, Father, as we uh, go from here this afternoon, that, uh, Lord, you would help us to, uh, to do, ex do exactly that, to walk by faith. Lord, when it doesn't make sense, help us to look past uh, our own selves, our own minds. Help us just to continue to look unto you, the author and finisher of our faith. Help us to say and stay on the race that you have set before us that runs right through this time. Help us to stay faithful, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All blessed and good afternoon.